Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful Sunday morning to bring us back together here at church and, and worship uh, who you are, who your Son is, and glorify your name and for our edification to grow in Christ so we can better serve you as your ambassadors of your kingdom. Lead us now in the truth. Be with those who couldn't be with us this morning. Comfort them, bring them the fruit of the Spirit again for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. So, uh, <laughs> turns out today is, it's going to be kind of weird, I guess, for lack of a better word, because there's a lot, there's a lot uh, in this lesson, and it's probably actually two weekends worth of stuff, so we're going to just take it, we're going to have the Holy Spirit drive us today. If it means we only get through like two slides, that, then that's the case, all right? Uh, I, w- I walked through this the last couple of days, and every time I end up going off on some tangent or story or something so i'm just gonna let him steer and we'll, we'll see where this goes but so uh we might have to save your notes for next week as well so last week we finished john chapter 4 when jesus met with the samaritan woman at the well so at the well jesus satisfies his appetite with the fruit of the spirit so to speak by doing the will of the father who sent him we know that from verse 34 and then his disciples returned to him from their grocery shopping and and they're like, are, are you hungry? He's like, no, I have food that you don't know about. So his disciple, he tells his disciples that more of this food, so to speak, uh, that was sowed in the Samaritans by he and the woman at the well is now ripe for reaping due to the testimony uh, that she was saying down there in the city. He told me all that I ever did. So the Samaritans believed in a lesser form of belief because of this woman. They had a lesser form of belief because of the woman's testimony, but acted on that seed that she kind of planted in their mind, that seed of belief, you could say, because we're on the theme of harvesting and food. And that seed led them to seek the truth directly from Jesus the Messiah for themselves. And this led us down this path of uh, discussing biblical belief versus like an intellectual belief. And we talked about how biblical belief doesn't come from seeing. But God, at the same time, doesn't want his believers to be blind, which, again, is kind of like a paradox. We're not supposed to have belief by sight, but we're not supposed to be blind either. What? All right. Uh, Polly, do you have James 1.5? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. So... That's going to be kind of a a theme we're going to be getting into this week and probably next week is wisdom and knowledge and understanding and believing without sight kind of thing. We'll get there. Galileans were believing Jesus by sight because of his signs in Jerusalem, not faith in his words in relation to Old Testament scriptures. If If you believe the Old Testament prophets, you believe me. So when Jesus returns to Cana and Galilee, an official from Capernaum approaches him in his belief and asked that Jesus heal his son. The nobleman from Capernaum then proves the existence of his faith, of his belief, by acting upon it with trust, obeying Jesus after he gives the command to go, your son will be healed, believing that Jesus' word is true and trustworthy and that his son will live. The man believed without seeing. He had, he had to go to Capernaum and see it for himself, but he believed it. He, he had to believe without seeing it for himself, But he knew why it wasn't a blind faith. He knew why he could believe. Obviously, he heard about Jesus and believed that these things were true. So it wasn't a blind faith, but he saw or he believed without seeing. Does that make sense? All right, Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. Now, this involves, uh, if I remember correctly, Abraham. We'll talk about this really quick. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Now this is important. This is why whoever authored Hebrews included this. Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Your offspring will be as numerous as the stars. He considered that God, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So, People have made the argument or tried to that Abraham acted by blind faith when he went to offer up Isaac with the sword, with his knife, and offer him as a sacrifice. But that's not the case. Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews is saying that it was done 
out of a biblical faith, not a blind faith, because he knew what God had promised him and knew that, well, God promised me my offspring will be as numerous as the stars. So if I do end up going through with this, which I plan to do because God said so, God can raise him from the dead and he'll have to do something like that because he made a promise. It wasn't a blind faith. He knew why he could trust in God. The man's faith was rewarded. The man from Capernaum was rewarded on his journey home, back to Capernaum, when he was informed by a servant that the exact hour Jesus told him his son will live, his son was in fact healed. So this sign further increased his belief, an additional reason for his belief, and also that of his household, okay? It was, uh, it was like a reward. You know, we know we talked about how God likes to reward our faith, and we'll, we'll, we will get rewards uh, one day in the next life. So this is like a reward. You know, you believe what I said and go, and then um, his faith was increased because of it. And this was the second sign in John's gospel. The third begins right now, all right? In John chapter 5. So again, we'll go through, this isn't even the whole chapter, but we'll go through as much as we can today and then pick it up next week. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades, colonnades, and these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been paralyzed, or no, had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going to, while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was a Sabbath, so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is a Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This is why the Jews were were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will be shown, will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, uh, and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection and judgment. So, we can really break this into two parts. The first part is, uh, is that uh, that parable, so to speak. It's not a parable. It's not, it's not a story Jesus told, but it's that story. But then, and it's, and it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's not, again, John's gospel is simple but complex at the same time. It's pretty straightforward. But once Jesus starts conversing with other religious leaders, he goes deeper, all right? So that's where we're going to start going pretty deep. So it's like a good warm-up. We'll probably get more into that deepness next week, though. So the first few verses here. After this 
was, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda. That's how we say it in American, which has five roof colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Okay, so again, Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. Again, even though he was going down, remember that conversation? He was going up the mountain to Jerusalem from the north. To what feast? Nobody knows but Jesus. You guys know that song, right? I don't like that song either, all right? <laughs> but it's true, okay? In this case, well, I mean, nobody knows but Jesus what feast this really is. There's a huge debate about it on in the theologian circles. Boring, okay? <laughs> it's, uh, what I've come to, listen, it's either Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, or Sukkot. Sukkot. Um, and then if you have your notes from last week, I had a different feast there, the one from Esther. I think it's the Feast of Lots, maybe. Uh, that's the big debate. Which one is it? And it does matter, but it's not spe specified in the text. So they're all like, which one was it? And I'll give you one reason, just one reason why it matters. If this was Passover, which it probably wasn't, then a whole year has passed since what we covered in John chapter 3, verse 22, where it ended. And then we could date four Passovers from Jesus' ministry and know it lasted, his ministry lasted about three and a half years. Okay? Now, regardless, I believe it did last three and a half years, and most theologians believe, or Bible expositors believe it lasted three and a half years, which is why, in part, that uh, the tribulation, which we'll probably get into next week, uh, is divided into two halves of three and a half years. Jesus was given three and a half years for his ministry. Satan demands equal time, and he gets it, all right? But then God gets three and a half years for, to, you know, bring his wrath upon the earth. All right, but it, this, I believe, was most likely the Feast of Booths. That's what I think, all right? But who am I, okay? So, colonnades is porches or pillared areas used for shade. In American terms, Bethesda was a nature-made community hot tub, all right? I don't know if it was really hot, but it did bubble, all right? Surrounded by five pergolas, all right? Or awnings, whatever, all right? Um, again, I like David Jeremiah's study Bible because it gives you some good historical context and history here about the Sheep Gate in this case. While the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem is walled in today, in the time of Jesus it was an open passage, perhaps named due, its, due to its function of allowing shepherds to move their herds in and out of the city. Archaeologists have discovered a pool near the Sheep Gate, presumably the pool in this passage. It's actually uh, north of the temple, about... Mm, a third of a mile to a quarter mile, which is fed by underground springs. The springs periodically would erupt and disperse the sediment and a, that apparently had a medicinal effect on those who were bathing. That or is probably most likely just superstition. Although, you know, uh, anybody in here like doing water aerobics, all right, or swimming? It, apparently that's pretty good for your joints, all right? Maybe that was kind of what it was, you know? Paralytics, oh, my legs hurt. How do your legs hurt? You can't feel them, but I'm going to go in the pool, all right? Now, Bethesda means house of mercy, implying a place for those with a fading hope. Invalids means, is from Asthenio, means to be weak, without strength, powerless. So we can deduce from this that these invalids, obviously enough, were in need of God's mercy, not just physically, but also spiritually. They, didn't, they I mean, this is what it came to. I'm relying on a hot tub for healing, all right? But what's missing from the, these verses here? Anybody see it? That's true. We haven't gotten there yet. You're getting ahead of the curve here. <laughs> no, we are. You're, you're good. But you're going... I don't even know why I bother saying it. You know, all right? She's... All right, I'm, a, I'm a great teacher because I got Trish thinking deeply here, but I didn't even mean to go that deep. What's missing is verse 4. <laughs> Oh, no? Which version you got? It's in, right? it's in there. What version do you have? Yeah. NIV? Yeah. NIV it's missing. ESV, which is what I'm using, is missing. How, how did we lose it? <laughs> what happened? Dr. Jim, do you have a theory? Was yours missing? Do you have verse 4? Verse 4? No. 
What version are you using? New King James. Because it wasn't in the original. It's in the King James Version. But are you talking original manuscripts? All right. Exactly. We'll tell that to the King James Version only people, right? Do we have any of those types in here? Don't raise your hand. It's fine. <laughs> I'm King James or nothing. All right. Well, maybe you might change your mind here. All right. So instead of me explaining it wrongly or incorrectly or not good enough, I just pulled this from gotquestions.org, and this gives us an explanation of why is this, where, where did this verse go? All right. So just sit back, relax, and struggle listening to my chirpy voice. John chapter 5, verse 4 is included in the King James Version, but in the New King James Version, the verse has a footnote attached explaining that it is not found in many Greek texts. The NASB, anybody use NASB? I just bought one the other week because uh, apparently it's a pretty good version, but the NASB includes the verse in brackets. The NIV places the verse in a footnote, and then it's, it's missing, and it's kind of like in a footnote in my ESV. So John 5, 4 is missing in the actual text. The disputed portion is this. This is what verse 4 says. Waiting for the moving of the waters, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. That's what verse 4 says, 3 and 4. But, but it's the man telling Jesus that. Right. Not... Right. Well, that could be an explanation. Um, whether that's actually true or not, uh, yeah, we talked about that, and we'll get into that a lot deeper when we get into Job, too. Just because something's in the Bible doesn't make what exactly is being said is true. Like, the, the uh, I think it was the Sadducees called Jesus, you know, Beelzebub, by the power of Beelzebub. Obviously, that's not true, but it's in the Bible. It could be something like that, but here's what Got Questions has to say about this. Here is a possible explanation of how John 5, 4 ended up in the Bible. So this isn't proved, but this could be an explanation. A scribe is writing out John 5, in which Jesus visits the pool of Bethesda. Quote, here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. But then the scribe gets to verse 7, as Jesus speaks to the man about his desire to be healed. And the man says, quote, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. That's verse 7. So the scribe considers the man's reference to stirred water as a source of possible confusion as John does not expound on it. He doesn't elaborate on this background. So the scribe writes a quick note in the margin to explain why the invalid was waiting for stirred water. He's providing context, but he's not trying to put it in the scripture itself. An angel came down at certain times to make something special happen. The scribe's notation was an attempt to aid the reader in understanding scripture. That was his motivation. But then, as more and more copies of that manuscript were made, the scribe's marginal note was transferred from the margin and inserted into the actual text as part of the passage. It's kind of like that game telephone, all right? These things just get skewed over time. It may be that the later copyist misconstrued the intention of the marginal note. Instead of being a, con a commentary of sorts, the note was seen as a scribe's attempt to correct the mistake, inserting a verse he accidentally left out. Thus, what the scribe meant as a helpful gloss resulted in John 5 expanded, expanding by one verse. So I, I have the David Jeremiah study Bible here. And you have the actual scripture up here, but then at the bottom you have David Jeremiah's comments on it, this commentary Bible. So what he got questions is, you know, speculating could be a reason for verse 4 now missing in some of the text, but being in the King, King James Version is that some later scribe had a David Jeremiah study Bible and was making copies, and it, instead of being written down here and separated by a line, it was probably just jot in in a margin, and then he didn't included it, all right? That's just one explanation, not necessarily the case. However, it's important to, I'm glad they finished this article with one paragraph here. It's really important that we read it. It's important to remember that the verses in question, which is always the case, are of minor significance. None of them change in any way the crucial themes of the Bible, nor do they have any impact on the Bible's doctrines. Jesus' death and resurrection Christ being the only way of salvation and the doctrines of heaven and hell, sin and redemption, and the nature and character of God, these doctrines are preserved intact through the work of the Holy Spirit who safeguards the word of God for all generations. It is not a matter of the newer translations missing verses. 
And it's not a matter of the King James Version translators adding to the Bible. It is a matter of determining through careful research and textual science what content was most likely part of the original manuscripts of the Bible. Said it before that. Technically speaking, the only inspired manuscripts or texts of the Bible were the originals that were written by the 40 plus authors of the 66 books of the Bible. However, with that being said, we know from our studies and from um, you know science that over 99% of the Bible is the original. It's, 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 it's copied and it's in cahoots with the original text. We know that from like uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? So we know that the Bible is true and trustworthy and reliable. And, and here's the thing about translations and transliterations. We also know from the words of Jesus and his, as his disciples in the New Testament and what they wrote and said, that they often used the Septuagint and not to, to uh, they, they quote the Septuagint, which is the first Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew Bible, a hundred years prior before Jesus came on the scene. Okay, so therefore we know that translations are good; they're protected by God because Jesus Himself used the translation. Okay, the Septuagint. Anybody uh, confused or anything? <laughs> Me too. You're in good company. All right. <laughs> Sometimes when you. Um... <clears throat> run into unbelievers, they'll ask a question, okay, if men wrote the Bible, how could it be inspired by God? Are you asking me now? Well, you know, it's something yeah. to think about no. in terms of being ready to answer that question. And these are unbelievers asking, yeah. obviously? Yes. Well, that makes sense according to their, their worldview, which is probably materialistic, right? Yes. They don't believe in the supernatural. And that's what spirit, the spirit realm is. It's beyond nature. So we can say, well, obviously God has to work in the natural, even though he himself is supernatural. But therefore, because he's supernatural, he is spirit. He has to work with the spirit. So it's the spirit and the natural, which he created, coming together, breathing his word out. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I mean, he goes back to 2 Timothy 3. 16 and 17. I have this memorized, but I'm going to read it. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Nancy knows it. Yeah. She's one in my group. But oh. I read it. Still waiting for my invite. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wouldn't last a day. All right. Here we go. Um, yeah, I'm just going to give up on anything else I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> if it comes back to me, I will. Man, they were such great points, but apparently not. God uses... Okay, so where are we at here? Um, man, I must have been clicking this thing away when I was going through this. Was I? Yes, I was. Holy shnikes. All right. There we are. No cheating. Don't read it, okay? So what is missing? Verse 4. All right. So one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. I'm 38 years old, but I know old, but yeah. <laughs> everyone just went, oh, all right. No. So um, that doesn't mean he was 38 years old. And as we'll discuss later in later verses, most likely he was much older than 38. All right. Uh, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a very long time, a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Answer the question. I'm yeah. Jesus. All right. So the first word that stuck out, new. This is another example of Jesus exercising his divine authority to know something other men or other people shouldn't know, like the woman at the well. He knew all the women had done, but when he was put on the Pharisees hit list, he, had, he learned that. All right. This is one of those things that he was either divinely given by the father, which is likely the case, given what we'll probably get into next week. Why Jesus chose this man can only be educationally guessed. We can only assume because it doesn't tell us, but we can kind of use the, uh, our education to figure out why. Here we go. We know God has mercy on whoever he chooses, first and foremost. And we'll get into this here in a couple of slides. All right. So why did he choose this man out of all the invalids at the pool? Well, God the Father obviously showed Jesus the one and only person he wanted Jesus to heal, all right? Um, we know God's focus is on the heart of man and outward appearance 
doesn't mean anything really to him. Now, does that mean God doesn't care about the afflictions of others? He absolutely does. We got to look at this from that spiritual perspective, that eternal perspective, that godly perspective. And we'll get into this in the next slide or so. What is this temporary life compared to eternity? No matter how hard your life gets, puff of smoke compared to eternity. And we'll get more into that here in a minute. All right. We know from verse 7 that through this, or though this man is lying at the pool, he has truly given up hoping in it. He also acknowledges that he needs help, admitting he cannot save himself. He has no one to carry him in the pool. And from verse 14, we can gather that it's likely he truly felt abandoned by God. And not saying that's without cause, okay? When we, when we discuss what led him to being paralyzed, it was most likely a sin that he did, all right? And so God may have abandoned him that way for his good purposes. We'll get more into that. So perhaps this is why Jesus saw him. He was completely broken, both spiritually and in his heart, but he could now be put together correctly. After all, the light shines brightest in the dark. So this is what we're going to get into now that we didn't have time to get into last week. Why do evil things happen in the world? Now, we kind of discussed this in previous classes, but it's always good to remind ourselves because this is, a, this is one of those questions that unbelievers like to ask all the time. And sometimes we ask it too, like, I'm, I'm a good person. Why is this happening to me? All right. And two Sundays ago, we had the guest preacher or speaker ask this very question. Why do, you know, bad things happen to good people? He goes, I don't know, but we know God did something about it through Jesus. But we can answer the question. First of all, it's pretty simple, you know, because the world has fallen. We know that from Genesis 3. Why did, why did bad things happen in this world? Because we live in a fallen world. All right. Thank you very much, Satan. Satan is the god of this world. Why do bad things happen? Why do evil things happen in the world? Because Satan's the god of the world. All right? The Bible says that. But why do bad things happen to good people? Well, a great way to go about this is define what good means. Define good. The truth says, God says, the word says, only God is good, and that everybody else apart from him deserves his wrath. Apart from the blood of Jesus deserves wrath. I'm a good person. No, you're not, right? When God flooded the earth and all those people and even the animals with it, right? We got to keep in mind that the earth was very evil. So actually, God was doing a very good thing, all right? God is Satan's enemy, and so he targets God's children. Think about that one. Art of war. Why would he want to go after and hurt but unbelievers, when he hates God and wants to hurt God. So go after believers. Go after those good people covered by the blood of Christ. All right. Um, that's not to say Satan doesn't uh, cause bad things to happen to bad people or people who don't believe in Jesus. He doesn't love them either. He loves nobody but himself. Okay. But it makes perfect sense why, you know, Satan would attack Job or Job. All right. Because he was a righteous man of God. But God uses the hard times in this temporary world for the good and light of eternity. And this goes back to the last slide. Why do bad things happen to good people? God can use those bad times for good. So, quick story that I heard once. A young woman brought up in a Christian household, goes off to college, gets corrupted at college, falls into sexual immorality. Con and this is in the 80s. She, she uh, contracts AIDS. Um, Finds out about it, comes home in tears. Uh, her family witnesses to her through the Bible, comforts her. She becomes a true believer and uh, ends up passing away. Better that than her contracting AIDS or th than her living in that sexual immorality and end up dying, even if it's 100 years later, and going to hell and spending eternity in hell. All right? Sometimes as humans, we, can, we, can, we focus too much on this life in the short game when God's always looking at the long game. All right? God can use hard times in this temporary world, and he does for good in light of eternity. But why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't God do something about this evil? He has. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He has done something. That's the only one of these I have memorized. So, Polly, he is doing something. God did not come into the world to, save them, to condemn the world, but to save the world. Exactly. Second coming is condemning. He has come to save. Uh, do you have Revelation 
And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He is doing something. He is right now making all things new. And he will do something. Second Peter. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Mm. Bottom line here because it's at the bottom, all right? If anyone comes up to you and says, I don't believe in God or I don't like God because of the evil in the world, he doesn't do anything about it, God is evil, you can just say to them, listen, my God is love. This world is corrupted not because of my God, but because of your God, all right? One day, my God will finish this, all right? And he'll throw your God where he belongs. Repent so you don't join him, all right? Do that in a loving way, all right? <laughs> uh, Matthew 12, verse 30. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. All right? Well, I don't believe in God, and I don't believe in Satan either. I just believe in doing good. Well, God says, if, you don't, if Jesus says, if you're not with him, you're against him. You're team Satan no matter what if you don't believe in Jesus. Why? Because if you don't believe in God, you're putting your own opinion above his truth. All right? That's a very scary thing to think about. All right? Well, Oh, I don't believe in God. So you're calling God a liar, and you're saying your opinion is superior to God's. Satan loves that. Satan uses that. All right. So here's the question that Trish just wants to focus on, so let's do it. No, I want to do another. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might bring this up. Paul prayed to be healed three times, mm. and God told him, No, my grace yeah. is sufficient for you. Is that right, Paul? I don't know, but you need to speak up. <laughs> <laughs> My grace is sufficient for you. Yeah, he told Paul that. And I guess he didn't want Paul to get the big head or something. You know, that kept him humble, mm -hmm. whatever that thorn in the flesh was. Yeah. So what we think is bad sometimes, work, it always works for our good. For all things work. Yeah. Lord God. I think we need to remember John 9 as well. Okay. When the disciples asked Jesus, so why is he blind? Who sinned? And Jesus responded, no one sinned. But God, my God in heaven is with you always. And I always take that as he cries with me always too. He laughs, he's, he celebrates, he cries. And that, you know, you had it previously. He has, he will, he does, you know. He's with us always. And that's our gift. Um, bad things to good people. Well, bad things happen to everyone. But my blessing is God is with me through it all the way. Another the second time today, you said something that, and now I forget what I was going to say. Man, <laughs> you just, you pull me right in. <laughs> no, it's good. You have a talent to shut me up. <laughs> You've been talking to Carrie. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, great, great, guys. I appreciate that. Yeah, very much. Um, okay, so Jesus asked him a pointed question to this paralytic. Do you want to be healed? And he doesn't give him an answer. All right. But, you know, you might look at this question and be like, well, what a rhetorical question or dumb question. Why would you ask us? Of course they want to be healed. Really? Do they? Jesus is being sincere here. Sincere here. You would be shocked, well, maybe you guys wouldn't be, but the world would be shocked that a lot of people actually prefer suffering because a shocking amount of people prefer hell over heaven, and that's what hell is. It's self-induced just suffering and the wrath of God. Blinded by pride, most people are deceived into believing good is evil and evil is good. Suffering is good. All right? God can use suffering for good, but he didn't create us to suffer. He created us to enjoy the fruit of the Spirit and joy. The sick man answered him, not with a yes, but, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was a Sabbath. So here was my question when I read this. All right, so, because we've been getting into this lately. If Jesus requires belief before performing miracles and healings, as seems to be the case from like Matthew 9, 28, 
He wants a verbal confirmation of their belief before he heals or does miracles. Why does this appear to be the exception? He heals the man, and the man didn't answer his question. He didn't show any sign of faith. There's another place that they, the lady who touched his garment. He That's a good point. That's right. And that, Sorry, Polly. I know you can't hear me. The lady who was healed, I got gotcha. you. She touched, yeah. So the woman who touched his garment didn't give a verbal confirmation of her faith. But that kind of goes with what we're going to get into here. It was her act was her faith. All right, so let's get into this. Awesome. Again, it's the condition of our heart that God is concerned with, which is our motivations, our desires, our, our will. Pride and arrogance leads to adultery and idolatry. We just talked about that. Which then makes sense that it leads to demands and expectations of signs, miracles, and healings for proof that one's own beliefs are false. All right? I have my beliefs. I have my truth. You have your truth. You have to prove to me that your truth is superior. All right? Or I'm not changing my truth. But the thing is, these people, spiritually blind in their heart, those who demand or expect to see such things, only an evil and wicked generation seeks a sign, would never yield to the truth regardless. You want proof of that, that they wouldn't yield even if the sign was given to them? Because the Bible says in Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. They got their proof. The very existence of the universe in themselves is the proof. All right? I mean, just look around. Let's, let's make this a lab. Just look around right now. Do you guys really exist, or are you just figments of my imagination? There's actually a philosophical theory called the, Bolts, the Boltzmann brain, where the only thing that exists is my brain and you all are just imagination foolishness all right <laughs> but look around like look at your hand whoa ow it works all right that's crazy why do we exist what is responsible for this existence we evolved out of soup all right campbell soup no there's an intelligent designer that's amazing all right just yeah just meditate on that let it blow your mind okay I know you've done that before. Just keep doing it. I try to do it every day, all right? This man did not ask for even one miracle, nor did he expect a miracle. He did not have a prideful heart, but a truly broken one. Like the Samaritan woman at the well, a heart that was now ripe for mending and harvesting. Uh, Polly, of Psalm 34. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Yeah. This man was also apparently abandoned by his family, had no one to carry him. God cares for the forsaken. We know that he cares for the widows, he cares for the orphans. He's very near to those, all right, children. In both cases, Jesus at the well with the woman or this man, the paralytic, Jesus knew exactly what their hearts needed and were open to receiving hope, a hope in him, all right? Now, I like this quote from A.W. Tozer. The flame, and this goes back to our conversation about God using bad things. The flaming desire to be rid of every unholy thing and to put on the likeness of Christ at any cost is often found among us. We should all live that way, right? We expect to enter the, the everlasting kingdom of our Father and to sit down around the table with sages, saints, and martyrs, and through the grace of God, maybe we shall, yes, maybe we shall. The flaming desire to be rid of every unholy thing and to put on the likeness of Christ at any cost is not often found among us. How often do we pray? Not my will, God, your will must be done, even if it means destitute, being destitute. Even if it means you take everything from me, if that's what it means to do your will, then so be it. That's a hard prayer to pray. Ours might be the silence of the untried soldier in the presence of battle-hardened heroes who have fought the fight and won the victory and who have scars to prove that they were present when the battle was joined. Paul was beheaded. Imagine sitting down with him and being like, I lived in a mansion, right? I ate four meals a day, right? The devil, things and people being what they are, it is necessary for God to use the hammer, the file, and the furnace in his holy work of preparing a saint for a true sainthood. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Whew, that one really rang true to my heart, man. I mean, obviously God can use whoever he wishes, but you know, there's, a, there's a saying among pastors like, you're going to be a true pastor usually he's got he's got to break you first he's got to break you all right no room for pride all right uh 
we'll do this last slide and then we'll call it a, call it a morning. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going another steps down before me, Jesus said to him, Take up, get up, take up your bed and walk. Jesus tests the paralyzed man, challenging him to do what he cannot do without God. Believe that you can get up and walk. Had the man not been willing to obey and try to rise, Jesus would not have healed him. What would have been the point? He was willing to. But at the command of Jesus, the man who had not walked in decades, think about that. He's not used to it. Have you ever seen Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, the parents that are in the bed, and when they first get up to go to the Chocolate Factory, he's like stumbling because he hasn't walked in probably 10 years. This is 38 years the man has not walked. And yet he acted in faith, he tried in Christ, and so he succeeded. Everyone knows Philippians 4.13, right? Except for me because I'm drawing a blank. Uh, what is it? Things through Christ who strengthens me. I knew I could depend on Polly, all right? So deeper still, taking this deeper still, you can look at this like Jesus is telling him, take up your cross and do what I say. Obey. Hmm. The man had no need to stay. Take up your bed. No need to stay at the so-called house of mercy anymore, Bethesda. He is now aware that God's mercy is with him wherever he goes because it's God's mercy that is responsible for his going in the first place. Man, what a blessing. You haven't been walking, and now every step you take, you're like, Jesus did this. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Man, God would be on your mind all the time, right? And you know what? We all have that. We can all walk only because of God's grace. We all take a breath because of God's grace. Think about that every time you breathe, all right? You won't think about anything else. <laughs> As we'll discuss in verse 14 next week, the man's constant reminder of what Christ did for him is now a cross to carry and that it convicts him to obey, right? Think about that. I'm walking because of Jesus Christ because of what he did for me. I better obey him. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Hmm. Cross to carry. He's carrying his bed. Jesus has another reason for telling him to take up his bed. It was a Sabbath. Wisdom, who is Jesus, Jesus is wisdom. Wisdom knows when to avoid controversies and when to create it. Let's get controversial next week, right? No, don't worry, we're not going to get it. We'll let Jesus get controversial, all right? Anybody else have anything? Jim, Dr. Jim. Verse for you, in terms of this discussion. Yeah. It's Isaiah chapter 25, sorry, 26, verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. In your mind, it's, oh, woe is me. I'm sick. I got this. I'm, it's all bad, bad. You got to trust God. Whatever the service, and that is so easy to say and sometimes so hard to do. That's what the scripture says. So I'm, I'm going to line up with that one. That's a good call to make. That's a great point. We talked about why do bad things happen or bad things happen to good people. Well, define good, but also if your mind is stayed on Christ, he's that peace. You'll you'll you, he'll bring you peace even when your life is difficult or you're hurting. Because he'll just by grace, he'll just keep reminding you. Like like Paul, my grace is sufficient. What is this life in reference to eternity? Hmm. All right. Anybody else? Thank you, well, Dr. Jim. When he asked, when Jesus asked, do you want to be healed? Yeah. He knew the answer. Jesus knew the answer. But he wanted him to he wanted him to ask for that because that shows his faith. That's a great angle. You don't receive because you don't ask. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Let's just keep this going. All right. <laughs> Sorry, JD. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Heavenly Father, thank you for this uh, lesson this morning. Um Please engrave it in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls and spirits. To better equip us to be your servants and your ambassadors as we go out into the world to serve you and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm just a dumb vessel. <laughs> amen, amen, amen.